Finally, it is time to talk about the 1.6 update balance changes. There are some pretty significant changes here. So what I'm gonna do is talk about all the notable buffs, neutral changes and nerfs, and then we will go over overall which skills and builds, for example, ranching, artisan, vineyard, mining, are going to be stronger or weaker in this patch. If you're someone that doesn't want anything spoiled, I am issuing a Stardew spoiler warning. As always, if you're new here, consider hitting subscribe. Let's start with what got better or buffed in this update. There's now a box with three tent kits added to the Ginger Island jungle. This is available as soon as you get to Ginger Island, and this is great because I find that it was sometimes difficult to get Ginger Island going at the beginning because you don't have the farmhouse and it takes a long time to actually get to the island, and you can't use your horse on the island at the beginning. So if you try to go to, let's say, the volcano dungeon, you cut it very close to be able to complete it before you pass out at night. Weapons now found in the wild have a chance to come with a basic innate enchantment and you can also re-roll that innate enchantment if the weapon has one at the forge using a dragon tooth. Now, dragon tooth is very rare, so I don't know how excited I am to spend them on this, especially because there are some new things in 1.6 that you can craft with the dragon tooth, but I found most times it's not worthwhile to use most weapons and I would go rusty sword, whatever next weapon I would find in the mines, obsidian blade, galaxy sword, almost always. I think this will open up some more options. Farm animals now gain a little happiness if you close the animal door behind them at night. I probably still won't close the doors, but it is nice to know that it actually is a benefit if you do close the animals in and let them out every single day. Grass now survives in winter, but it won't spread like it does in the other seasons. And then if you cut grass during the winter, it's much less effective. And what that means is you will get much less hay harvested if you cut it in winter. This is an amazing change. The amount of money I spent on grass starters every spring was obnoxiously high. There's a few changes to recipe skill requirements for the kiln the cookout kit, and the worm bin. So the kiln is going from foraging level four to foraging level two, so that will help you get a little bit earlier coal if you have some extra wood lying around. The cookout kit, which is mostly only useful early before you get the kitchen in your own farmhouse, is down from foraging level nine to foraging level three. And then the worm bin, you can start getting it at fishing level four instead of eight, and it will actually produce more bait. So instead of two to five, it will produce four to five pieces of bait. This is obviously a great change because the worm bin just seems to not be really worth it once you get it. So having a little bit of free bait early, I think will help with fishing income. You can now chop down a tea bush to give back a tea sapling. I mentioned the fruit trees giving back a sapling in my quality of life video, but technically this is listed as a balance change and I didn't notice at the time, the tea bush also gives back a sapling. Both make growing trees and bushes a little bit less finite feeling where you have to plant it in the perfect spot. By the way, if you're enjoying the video, please leave a like to help other 1.6 players find this content. Snake vertebrae are now easier to get. I don't know if you've experienced the pain of this, but let me tell you. I wanted to get perfection on my second farm before this 1.6 update came out and the lack of snake vertebrates delayed me so many days, maybe even a month of getting perfection. You have to wait for artifact spots to spawn, which was not very often. And even then it only had a 12.5% chance to be a snake vertebrae. I did learn right near the end that if you don't dig up that spot that day, I did learn if you dig up an artifact spot and it wasn't what you wanted, you could restart the day and sleep one more day and then you have a chance to get something else, but that's a lot of work and it just, it was really frustrating. So now you can fish them from the river as well and overall it just won't delay you getting the snake vertebrae. Santa's train car can now drop gifts. So I haven't experienced this in person yet, but I have rarely experienced the Santa's train in all 2,500 hours of Stardew Valley that I've played, but this is a really nice change and it makes running to the train tracks a little bit more worthwhile. 
The botanist perk now applies to items dropped from trees. Topaz ring. I have seen this mentioned over 40 times in Stardew Valley videos about how useless the Topaz ring is because it gave you a precision stat that wasn't even used in the game. Finally, it has a use again and it now gives plus one defense. The loom has a higher chance of giving double cloth when processing quality wool. Maybe I'll build a loom now. Fish pawns have an extra chance to produce extra row whenever they do produce row. Maybe I will build a fish pawn now. Geode crushers no longer require coal to operate. Definitely will build a geode crusher now. It was almost never worthwhile to use the geode crusher. And by the time you get it in the game, I think that it is perfectly acceptable that you don't need coal to operate it. The new mushroom logs and the mushroom boxes from the cave you get from Demetrius now grant five foraging experience on harvest. There are quite a few more ways to get forage experience now, which is good because it was actually kind of hard to level up your foraging unless you were doing a lot of tree chopping, which takes a lot of energy. Monsters on the farm now give combat experience, but it's one third of the normal value. This does exclude slimes in the slime hutch. They still give you 100%. There's some adjustments for penalties when you're knocked unconscious. You can no longer lose the golden scythe, infinity weapons, or tools. You can no longer lose more than three items and the amount of money you lost now scales with how much you have. So it's less punishing if you don't have money, but more punishing if you have a lot. The maximum lost raises from 5,000 to 15,000. Overall, this makes dying in the mines or skull cavern way less punishing and I for one really appreciate that. There's a couple drinks that now give you a speed boost. Green tea gives you 0.5 speed and it's for a decent amount of time. Whereas Joja Cola gives you a very short speed buff, AKA a caffeine boost and crash for about 30 seconds. There's now coal nodes in the volcano dungeon. Clint can crack geodes even if he is upgrading a tool. This is technically a quality of life change, but it wasn't announced when my quality of life video came out. And this is definitely also a buff to Clint's personality. So I decided to include it here. Slightly boosted the quarry output. Daily quarry output now increases each year up to a limit. This is really helpful because the quarry seemed kind of useless after the first time you cleared it out. So now the neutral changes. So maybe some of these people would consider a buff or a nerf, but to me they just don't affect the game enough. So I wanted to put them in their own category just to break things up a little bit. So first up we have home renovations. They now cost money, but then it's refunded if you undo the renovation. If you did buy any renovations pre 1.6, the renovation won't give you free money. But I think this is a neutral change because yes, it costs money to build, but then you get the money back if you decide to unbuild. So it's just another use for that late game money. Raise the price of the second house upgrade from 50,000 to 65,000 gold, but reduce the number of hardwood needed, 150 to 100. It's a little bit easier to get hardwood now, now that we have mahogany trees, but I still find early hardwood is a very precious resource and I would rather pay a little bit more gold, but keep some of that hardwood for other crafting. So that's why I put it in the neutral category. Adjusted gift tastes for several NPCs. I haven't really explored too much what these are, but I think from past gift taste changes, they usually just make sense to people's personalities. So I think overall, it's just a neutral change. Harvesting forage crops from wild seeds now give much less foraging experience, but grant some farming experience. I think this is a neutral change because there are many more ways to get foraging experience now. And if you are using some of your precious tillable land for these foraging crops, you should get some farming experience as well. This one, I might need your help on because I couldn't find anything about this. It says secret notes are no longer created during festivals except passive festivals like the night market and the desert festival. So I don't know if that is something that was glitching people's games where they were getting a secret note during a festival, but then not actually putting it in their inventory, or if people were glitching it in the other way where they were getting a bunch of secret notes in one festival. So if you know this one, please let me know in the comments. Adjusted fish variety in the ice fishing festival. Now, if you are a fishing hater like me, you would say this is actually a nerf because it does add some more difficult fish for you to catch. 
but it does make the ice festival a little bit more fun. So I'm gonna leave it as neutral. You can decide if it's a buff or a nerf yourself. All right, let's get into the nerfs. These are the ones that are going to cause some chaos in the Stardew community. So let's just whip through them right now. You have to collect and not just donate the four prismatic shards for the four precious stones key quest or QI quest as I was calling it for one video and got trolled so hard. This was just the easiest quest to ever do because I would always just make sure I had at least four prismatic shards at all times and then you just immediately donate them and get some QI gems. Especially if you had perfection on a farm, you could just check every week to see if that was the quest and just get so many gems. This one, as much as I hate it, I think it was probably necessary. Ancient seed packets can no longer be sold at the traveling cart. I am going to talk about this in depth when I get to the analysis in part four of this video, but I think this could have in some cases a very low impact and in some cases an extremely high impact. So stay tuned and we will talk all about that. Slime hutches are now significantly smaller. I put this one as a nerf just because I liked how big the slime hutches looked on the farm. I think it made it really stand out during farm design. And as you can see here, now that my slime hutch is so much smaller, it makes this area that I dedicated to it seem kind of almost silly, but I suppose maybe now I could fit two side by side and it would still be fine. Tapper, I know people are gonna hate this one. It now requires foraging level four to get the tappers unlocked. So you might unlock it roughly the same time now that there's more ways to get experience from foraging, but this will delay making oak resin and therefore kegs by possibly, you know, a week a month, maybe even more if you don't do any foraging normally. And then we know that because you're delaying the oak resin, the amount of kegs you can build will slow down as well at the beginning of the game. So again, we'll talk about this when we get to vineyards, but I think this is going to drastically shift how people play the early game of Stardew Valley. We have three price reductions. We have the tea saplings, which is going to be a change that a lot of people hate. The Price is going from 500 to 250 gold. Now, there are a lot of guides out there of how to make insane money with tea saplings only. And it's just very glaring that it was not intentional, but it was really fun. So I don't know if somebody's gonna redo the math on if it's still worth it at all to get tea saplings early, but I might even test it out myself because I'm just really curious. Then we have the life elixir. This is another one that I might want to hear from you in the comments. It's going from 500 gold to 250 gold. I don't know if there was a strategy where you would get a bunch of life elixirs, but because the crafting recipe is pretty difficult, I just can't see people abusing this one. So the only thing I could think of is I do find a lot of them in Skull Cavern and maybe they want to encourage you to drink them versus just selling them. Then we have the fairy dust reducing from 500 to 300 gold. Again, I'm not really sure why because fairy dust is already kind of an expensive thing to produce and it's pretty useful to actually use, but maybe some people were just using crystallariums and growing full fields of fairy rose flowers and then just selling them all. I don't know, it's not a strategy I ever used, but again, maybe it's just to incentivize people to use them on the artisan good machines. The prices of the bombs in the door shop are going up pretty substantially. And I think this is gonna impact all the builds that don't utilize mining as their primary source of income a lot. We'll get into that a little bit more later, but the iron looking bombs are going from 600 to 1000. And then the mega bombs, which are the red bombs, the large red bombs are going from 1000 to 1600. So you really have to want to invest in those bombs. Otherwise, it might make more sense just to craft them naturally or to just not use as many bombs in the mines. Prismatic shard drop rate from Iridium nodes is going down from 4% to 3.5%. I found that I never found prismatic shards in Iridium nodes anyways, maybe I'm just unlucky, but now it's gonna be even a little bit tougher. The mushroom cave now provides mushrooms every second day. So I always thought that this maybe had changed and I wasn't sure if it was intentional or not, but in 1.5, you could get mushrooms every day. And I never had remembered doing that, but I thought maybe I just wasn't checking as often as I should, but it's back to every second day. However, now that you do get some experience from the mushrooms, I think overall it won't be too much of a negative impact. 
Randomization no longer produces simple repeating patterns in many cases. So the biggest example of this is clay farming on the beach. I never personally did this, but it was really powerful early and especially for speedrunners to go to the beach on the first couple days of the month and find the pattern for the clay and then you could make a ton of money since clay does sell for a pretty good price. So now this is turned off and there is no repeating patterns. However, if you are a speedrunner or just liked this feature, you can use legacy randomization in the advanced options when you're starting a new farm to use the old randomization. But there are some specific patterns that may still change due to the underlying changes. So you might want to play around with that. Till dirt on the island farm now decays the same way as the regular farm. I was afraid that this one was going to happen because I never had to worry about replanting my crops and when I was, it would already be watered and tilled from the sprinklers for the most part. Now you have to keep them planted very regularly if you want to keep the work that you've done. So it is... It makes sense, but I'm still kind of salty about it. All right, so all the changes I didn't mention so far in this video, but were in the patch notes, I did include in the video description in the three categories, buff, neutral, and nerf. And I put all the ones I didn't mention after a space between the ones I did talk about. So you can see the full complete list, but some of them, there was just nothing to say about them. So I just decided to save the time in the video to talk about the ones that really make an impact. Now for our final section. Let me just say, some of these are going to require a full deep dive and probably their own video, which I will get to eventually. But right now, let's just talk about the different playstyles and income paths and how they are affected by these changes. This is kind of a high level overview so that you can sort of understand what what you might need to adjust in your own playthroughs. Let's talk about how each skill is affected. With foraging, the changes listed here, we can see there are a lot more ways to get experience from foraging, which is great, but other than maybe getting to level 10 faster, if you forage a lot, there's nothing really substantial from these changes. However, because mushrooms can now be processed in the dehydrator, there could be an extra incentive to forage a lot of mushrooms. Mining. You might remember before that I indicated the playthroughs that do not focus on mining as the primary source of income might struggle in year one and two with the bomb price increases. So this is because playthroughs that spend very little time in the mines need most of the resources they do get for crafting. There's typically nothing left over to spend frivolously on bombs. I know I typically just bought bombs when I did need to do a skull cavern or volcano dungeon run until I got to year three or four where I had a lot of money and then I would just buy a few bombs for each run just to help me get through some of the levels quicker. Now what about when mining is your primary money making activity? Well at first I thought because you typically get a lot of ore and now you're incentivized even further to craft the bombs versus buy them, I still came to the conclusion that to make substantial money from mining, you have to convert most ores, especially gold, which is used for mega bombs, for blacksmith bars. Even with the geode crushers not using coal anymore, which will help geodes be more profitable, I'm thinking mining focused playthroughs become slightly weaker. Fishing. Fishing seems to be the big winner of the 1.6 update. Nearly everything related to fishing has gotten better buffer and easier. We can't forget that the fish smoker, which you also start out with a free one if you pick the Riverlands farm, by the way, not only doubles a fish's value, but it keeps the quality of the fish as well. So you can end up with some really valuable smoked fish. There is also some new baits in the game, which will make fishing even better and more lucrative. Fishing will start to move from a year one spring activity to maybe even a viable long-term money-making activity. Combat is another winner in the 1.6 update. There was basically only good changes in my opinion to combat. And even though it is not a primary money-making strategy just to do straight combat, you do need to use combat 
in conjunction with everything else you do, so I'm glad there are some good perks and changes here. Farming had a couple buffs and a couple nerfs, but nothing substantial that changes it from being the primary source of income for most playthroughs. As I mentioned before, you will have to be more diligent with your ginger island farm, especially if you are growing crops that do not produce multiple harvests, but the play might be just to grow pineapple and ancient fruit only from now on, if you weren't doing that already. Lastly, we are going to talk about specific income producing activities. This is where things get really interesting to me, especially with artisan. So let's start there. With the dehydrator and fish smoker, there are now so many more artisan goods to sell, which makes the artisan profession even stronger. Smoked fish also benefit from the angler and fisher professions. So when combined with the artisan profession, a smoked fish can sell for 2.8 times its base price. Looms will also produce double wool more reliably, especially with gold and iridium quality wool. Maybe it comes worth it now to have a barn full of sheep, but this is one of possibly the spiciest changes of all changes. No ancient seeds sold at the traveling cart. Personally, most of my playthroughs, I have gotten my first ancient fruit. Personally, most of my playthroughs, I have gotten my ancient fruit production started because of the traveling cart. As long as you get one in the traveling cart by the beginning of fall, which is typically the earliest you can unlock the greenhouse, or if you are a Joja person, you can probably get it even sooner, you can start the ancient fruit to ancient fruit wine pipeline at about that time. Now, without that other option, you may still find an ancient seed before you open the greenhouse, but if not, that can significantly delay how long it takes you to have a greenhouse full of ancient fruit plants. Especially because you normally grow one ancient fruit, change the first harvest into another seed, or if you're lucky, two or three seeds, and then start multiplying from there. If you didn't get your first ancient fruit until, let's say, summer of year two, it's probably going to be winter by year two by the time you are really rolling and having that full greenhouse so you can reliably make ancient fruit wine. That's a delay of almost a year and how much income that translates to is probably millions. So I think overall there's just a greater luck factor here, but it's going to be interesting to see if people shift away from the ancient fruit since it is slightly less reliable, at least in the first couple years. All right, let's talk about tea saplings. I hate to say it, but I think this money making strategy might be a goner. From what I remember about tea saplings, it might still be slightly profitable to convert regular quality spring, summer, fall, winter seed crops into the seeds and then into the tea saplings. But of course it will be $1,250 less profitable than before. So once you start getting higher quality crops or using artisan machines for things like crystal fruit wine or crystal fruit jelly, it likely moves from a profit to a loss. This one might deserve its own video, so stay tuned for that. Ranching. So with ranching, if you're including converting animal products into artisan goods, it does get better because of the loom changes and even the snake vertebrae becoming easier to get, which helps you unlock ostriches earlier, which are a very good source of multiple males. If you consider ranching strictly just the animal products without converting them, this playstyle also is getting buffed because the changes like closing the door behind the animals, and the new blue grass, which you start with, by the way, on the Meadowland Farms. Both increase animal friendship faster, which means higher quality goods faster. I'm going to actually do a full playthrough on the Meadowlands Farm after I finish this video, so I'm going to focus on animals a lot, so I will let you know more in depth if this does become a good money maker. With Apiary, there's no significant changes to honey other than, like with kegs, you will have a slower start to get maple syrup since tappers take until level 4 to unlock, especially if you do very little foraging. It might be around the same time as I've mentioned a few times because there's more ways to get experience from foraging, but I'm just going to go on the cautious side for now. And lastly, let's cover blacksmith playthrough. I covered most of this with the mining skill, but one thing I do wanna say with the blacksmith playstyle 
is because you can get a kiln early and maybe not need a lot of wood for other things, having an early source of coal could really boost your blacksmith bar production early. I still think the mining route might be weaker overall, but this is another one to test for sure. There are a lot of other play styles that we haven't covered in this video, but is there any that you thought were affected big time by these changes? Let me know in the comment if there's any of the professions you would want me to do a deep dive in and I will try to make it happen. Thanks for watching. This is a long one. I hope you learned a lot about the balance of 1.6.